Hi, what we're going to talk about for this um, class is going to be behavior theory or behaviorism. And this is a field which got its start kind of in a different fashion from how most of the other fields that, or models or theories that we've talked about got started. So generally speaking, you know, the story has been that this person was trained as an analyst and then became frustrated with analysis and the story goes onwards. But the behavioral folks actually have their roots sort of in a different forest. The foundation for what is behavior theory or behavior therapy these days has its beginnings in psychological learning theory so that rather than looking at or being a number of people who got their start trying to reduce or help solve the puzzle of human misery, human suffering, psychological disorders, mental illness, kind of whatever medical slash mental health problem we're talking about. Behaviorists drew from people who were in laboratories at universities and elsewhere who were studying rats and studying pigeons and studying cats and cockroaches and um, kitchlets, which are little aggressive fish, and writing about the behavior of very much more simple creatures than humans and studying how these animals learned. And so when we think about behaviorism, we really do go back to like first name on the board here, Ivan Pavlov, with, as I put it when I teach my cognitive behavior class, his drooling dogs. So dogs and dogs who were in a study by a gastroenterologist, Ivan Pavlov, who was not a psychologist, but, and their response to meat powder really launched one of the fields of the behavioral sciences um, and, and with the idea of classical conditioning, which we will get to in a few minutes. Other behaviorists were studying other kinds of conditioning. The most common name, um, probably, of what is known as O-print or instrumental conditioning is B.F. Skinner. And other names which go along there, there's a guy at Tolman, there's um, a guy whose name is Guthrie, there's a guy whose name is Hull, I believe it's Clark Hull. And what they were doing was studying how an animals behave and how they learn in order to like get goodies or things like that. And that's called over and conditioning. And it wasn't until way down the line that more kind of complex behavior moved into the field of behaviorism. But these psychologists were studying, you know, rats and pigeons and dogs and cats and so forth at the turn of the last century, so at the early 1900s, in their laboratories. And then somewhere around the middle of the last century, people started kind of saying, huh. Well, if we know that this is how animals learn, or if we know that if we do these kind of weird things to an animal's learning environment, that we may end up with a kind of oddball animal or an animal that looks like it's just not really psychologically well put together, I wonder if that might make sense for humans. And they also took some of the ways that they taught animals to learn and said, could you apply the models of learning theory, which we know work for rats and pigeons and dogs and cats, could you apply those to humans who are suffering? And lo and behold, they found that principles of learning, generally speaking, with you know a couple changes here and there, seem to apply reasonably well to explain human behavior. So that's how the field of behaviorism began. If we look at sort of the main ideas of behaviorism, it starts with this fundamental concept, and this is, this is again, historical. So if we look at modern behaviors, and modern behaviors do not believe a lot of the stuff that I'm going to go over in the next few minutes. But in an earlier time, before we had the Human Genome Project, and before we had PET scans and SPECT scans, and knew all about neurotransmitters and so forth, things were, if not easier, similar. So a belief of behavior theory, sort of fundamental belief about human behavior, is that we are born blank slates, tabula rasa, to use a term from philosophy or from history. We are all born 
with equal opportunity and equal potentiality to become anything that we would like to be. And one of the early, I think one of the earliest, what was he, found, um, presidents of the American Psychological Association, anyhow, John B. Watson, who was a very famous psychologist at the turn of the last century in the 1900s, has a statement, give me give me any healthy baby and I will turn him or her into anything you like. Butcher, baker, candlestick maker. We're all born with equal potentiality, a blank slate. And we are then a product of our learning and environment. So what leads one person to become a Mother Teresa, another person to become an Adolf Hitler, another person to become a, let's say, just kind of run-of-the-mill, you know, a fast food or grocery store clerk, what leads some people to be incredibly warm and loving and giving and others to be, you know, cold-hearted, crafty, kind of predatory individuals is we are a product of our learning. Now, since early behaviorism, we've come to appreciate that it's not nearly so simple. And so modern day behaviorists have abandoned this lovely naive notion that everybody is born absolutely equal and we are only a product of our environment and our learning. And we now appreciate that when we, from the moment of conception on, there are a lot of parameters placed on us in terms of our temperament, in terms of our intellect, in terms of our um, what forms into our personality, in terms of a lot of different things. And so from conception through prenatal development, through very early childhood development, we know that a lot of things impact us. And not everybody is born with equal potentiality. We're born with different intellectual capacities. We're born with far different temperaments. And babies with different temperaments will turn into different people, even if raised in the exact same or very similar learning environment. So we're not quite a blank slate. That doesn't mean that the models and the principles and the tools of behavior theory don't work. It just means that they're not the whole picture. We now appreciate that they're only a piece of the picture. Nonetheless, this was where it was started that we are a product of our learning and consequently if you look at how do people develop into healthy functioning pro-social individuals or how do people develop into very scary tyrants? It's all a matter of what we have learned. The great thing about that is that if somebody comes into your office at the age of 5 or at the age of 55, even though they have learned to be the person they are, we never truly stop learning. And consequently, if we can just help the person to learn a healthier way to adapt to their world, or if not a healthier way to or if the way they've learned to adapt is terribly unhealthy, it may not just be learn a healthy way, but unlearn the unhealthy patterns and relearn newer, healthier patterns, then people can change and people will learn new things and people will behave in more pro-social and healthy ways and their lives will become better. That fundamental belief is still strongly held by behaviorists as well as by the cognitive behaviorists. So when we talk about cognitive behaviorism and I talk about um, skill, skill acquisition or skills training. Behaviorists do lots of skills training. It's helping somebody who doesn't have knowledge about how to do something, which is important to do, learn the skills so that they can do that. That's learning theory and what they draw upon are the fundamental principles that we have come to appreciate through learning psychology work to help people to learn. The original goal of behavioral theory, and again, one of these kind of naive notions which has definitely been shown to be erroneous, was that if you could control a person's learning environment completely, if you could control the antecedents, which are things that happened before, and you could control the consequences, the things that happen after or as a result of behavior, completely, that you could control and predict behavior pretty much 100% of the time. There was, when I was in graduate school, there was this little thing that they drew, S stimulus, here's the response. And this thing, which is supposed to be a black box, which is a 
quite a black box, but nonetheless. This thing is the black box, and the black box is you. So everything that the analysts and the humanists and all of those other theoretical models say is who you are. It's your personality. It's your essence. It's your spirit. It's your soul. It's your mind. It's your heart. The behavior said it really doesn't matter. What matters is that I can control the stimulus. What the organism is, it doesn't matter. If I can control the antecedents and I can control the consequences, I can control and predict human behavior. This was a belief for a brief time in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. It kind of came on the stage and people sort of snorted at it and people did a couple of very moderate tests and tried utopian communities in, in literature and so forth. It turns out that what's in the black box really makes a huge difference. And we've come to appreciate that through a whole variety of different sciences. And, and so behaviors, again, have sort of moved off from that. But this notion that even though it doesn't predict and control fully, that an appreciation for the antecedents or triggers of a behavior, an appreciation for the consequences or outcomes of a behavior, that if we can control those to some extent, we can make a big difference in terms of how people interface their life. This works, and there's lots of empirical data that says it works and can bring about change in people. So anyway, that being said is kind of the, the overarching framework. Let's go through three of the main areas of behavioral, behavioral models. Historically, Ivan Pavlov lived in the latter part of the 1800s, and probably any one of you watching has taken a general psychology class in which you learned about Pavlov and his dogs. Pavlov was a gastroenterologist who was studying salivation in dogs and had this whole fancy hookup done where he could gather dog saliva and all kinds of stuff. His study was set up in such a fashion that there was a sound that happened prior to this meat powder that the dogs had. And meat powder is you know, food, and a hungry dog will salivate. A hungry mammal will salivate for food. But the food delivery was paired with this tone, or bell, or sound, or something. And what Pavlov found, kind of by accident, was that after a while, the sound, the tone would sound, and before the dogs ever got one little hint of meat powder, they started salivating. Now, what Pavlov could have done was thrown up his hands, gotten frustrated, moved on to another study, and none of us would have ever heard about him again. But that wasn't what Pavlov did. He took this kind of serendipitous accidental find, and he said, this is interesting. Maybe I should do something about this. Maybe I should pay attention to it. And now he's in every intro psychology book for the last 100 years. What he called this is classical conditioning. And if you have learned words like conditioned stimulus or conditional stimulus and conditioned response and unconditioned stimulus and response, we're not going to bother to get into that. But sort of the essence of classical conditioning is that if you pair a neutral stimulus, something that doesn't automatically elicit a reaction, with a biologically meaningful stimulus, something which does elicit a reaction. And usually the reaction it elicits is something which isn't under your conscious control. We generally don't say, gosh, I think I need more saliva. Um, and automatically can produce salivation. The way that we say, geez, I'd like to raise my right hand, and we do. So it's a non-voluntary response. We don't say, boy, I'd like my pulse to be 10 points lower, and just have it drop. As we talk about in the reality therapy lecture, if you want to drop your pulse or something like that, you have to usually think about something very calming or do some very soothing activities. You can't just automatically cause it to occur. Well, classical conditioning happens with these non-voluntary kinds of behaviors, such as pulse, such as blood pressure, such as salivation. So you get this neutral thing, a tone, paired with a biologically meaningful thing, meat powder. After a while, the dogs start salivating to the tone. Tones do not naturally produce salivation in dogs. But if you pair it with the meat powder enough times, lo and behold, it does. In human behavior, a lot of the classical conditioning that we see, or actually a lot of what we do is we try to undo the results of classical conditioning. And the most common way that people will come in 
is through some sort of conditioned fear. So if you have that somebody was in a car, they were driving down the road, they were sitting in front of Safeway, and wham, they got ruined. Now they find that they're driving their car, driving in front of Safeway in and of itself does not cause a biological reaction. Getting slammed into, getting rear-ended by somebody does. Now they find that every time they're riding with someone or driving and they pass Safeway, they have this huge fear response. That is a classically conditioned response. Riding in a car past Safeway does not naturally cause a response unless somehow you love Safeway or hate Safeway. But if you were rear-ended, when you go past, this classical conditioning it kicks in. And that's the kind of thing that therapists would be called, for, called upon to intervene. How is it that I can ever drive past Safeway again, it's on my way home, without just panicking? So there's lots of other things which will classically condition in. If you've ever eaten a food and then you got the flu the same day, many times that food that you ate prior to getting the flu, you kind of look at and you say, Ugh. I was on an airplane one time and eating airplane peanuts and we were bebopping around these little puffy white clouds and all of a sudden my stomach didn't feel so very good. Well, it was a long time before I could eat peanuts again. The peanuts didn't cause me to get sick. Being on the airplane, be bopping around on the clouds did. But I was eating peanuts at the time, so I classically conditioned the nausea to the peanuts, and it was years before I could eat peanuts. So that's classical condition. What Skinner studied some years later in the 1900s gets called oferent or sometimes instrumental. Conditioning. And what instrumental conditioning is, is that classical conditioning is over non-voluntary behavior. Instrumental conditioning has to do with voluntary behavior. That's the things that we can choose to do. We choose to move our body around through space. But we can choose not to. So what Skinner and Tull, yeah, Hull and Guthrie and so forth studied were animals and could animals learn to do things? So the classic thing is, you know, you put the rat in the box with a, box, with a contraption where there's a lever. And if they press the lever, they get food. If you give tasty little pellets to a rat for pressing a lever, you can bet that over time, they will learn to become pretty darn efficient at pressing that lever. If you have a maze, the simplest maze is the tea maze. And you have a rat in the maze. And in general, the rat half of the time goes to the left and half of the time goes to the right. But then, you put a piece of cheese on the right hand turn of the maze. You will train yourself to have a right turning rat. The rat learns to turn to the right because he has been reinforced. Reinforcement is the sort of thing that you do in order to bring, in, in order to increase the likelihood of a response. And positive reinforcement, generally speaking, is giving people something good, appetitive, likable, in order to increase the likelihood that they'll engage in a behavior. So if you want a rat to turn to the right, you take, you take the rat to get them hungry, put something you like, like cheese down here, and you will develop yourself a right-turning rat according to the rules of behavior. So this is voluntary behavior. And it shows that if we reward people for doing good things, they're more likely to do them. The, uh, another thing that you can do under sort of the rubric of instrumental or operant conditioning or, is punishment. Reinforcement is something that we do when we want to increase or enhance the likelihood that a behavior will occur. Punishment is something that you do when you want to decrease the likelihood that a behavior will occur. So if someone's doing something that you do not want them to do because it's dangerous to themselves, it's dangerous to others, you can punish them. Punishment hopefully will decrease likelihood. So the most common forms of punishment, you know, if you just think of 
pop a punishment in your head, most people will think of, you know, that a kid is squabbling with his or her brother or sister, or is running out into the street or doing something that a parent doesn't like, and the parent swats the child on the butt. They spank him. Spanking is a commonly sort of jumps into my head as a form of punishment that people tend to think about. So, but there are many other things that you can do which should be counted as punishment. It's something that you do to try to reduce the likelihood of a behavior, and that's the behavior that you want to see less of. What happens in reality is that people will try to punish people to make them do more of something. You'll punish your kid so that he or she does their homework. But technically speaking, that really doesn't work because you punish what you want to see less of not what you want to see more. So you should reinforce your kid in some way to bring about maybe doing more homework. But so reinforcement is what you do when you want to increase behavior, and punishment is something you do when you want to decrease behavior. If you get into the nuances, there's positive and negative punishment, positive and negative reinforcement, but this is a general lecture. We're not going to get into the nuances. This covers lots of behavior and is widely used later on when we talk about applications is widely used in what gets called behavior modification or BMOD, which is a huge form of kid control in schools around the world. It's also used a lot in residential treatment facilities. It's used in psychiatric hospitals. So it's very, very widely used. And it's also used by parents around at least the nation, if not around the globe, in terms of trying to help develop pro-social, healthy, well-functioning kids. And we'll talk more about it when we talk about applications. The last kind of major school of behaviorism has um, Albert Bandura is the name most associated with this. And Bandura is known for his theory, which he calls social learning theory. And social learning theory is mostly what we could also call modeling. So while in classical conditioning, the person or animal actually has to go through the experience him or herself. And while in overweight conditioning, the person him or herself actually has to engage in the behavior and experience the reinforcement or the punishment in order to learn. What Bandura showed by studying, social, by studying um, behavior was that you really don't need to actually physically go through a behavior and physically be rewarded or punished in some way, shape, or form, you can just watch. You can just watch people do something, and lo and behold, you can learn how to do it. This sounds like an amazing no-brainer, but in reality, this was kind of groundbreaking work, and there was a lovely study done with rats in a tea maze by a guy named Edward Tolman, and Tolman had rats watching other rats learn how to get cheese. And then he found that without ever eating a piece of cheese, if you had a rat watch other rats make their way through this maze, you could take them off the observation deck, put them in, and they could do the maze much better than rats who hadn't watched you know, their litter mates actually perform this behavior. But that was kind of a real groundbreaking experiment in, in its day, which was back in the late 1950s. Well, Bandura through the 60s, 70s, um, 80s, so forth, studied mostly humans and how it is that we learn without needing sort of a tangible physical reward or needing to take our body through actually doing something, but just by watching others. And what he learned is we do what we say, which again, as I said, seems to us to be a no-brainer. Where the applications of this are important is that if you personally are concerned about you know, kids or adults sort of picking up or catching bad habits or bad behaviors from simply being among others who display them. Bandura has the scientific verification that this is a possibility. So that when people are concerned that by watching too much violence on television, children or adults in society may become more violent, they'll often turn to some of the studies done by Bandura and his sort of um, colleagues, which shows that what kids see, kids are more likely to do. If kids don't see it, they're not as likely to do it as kids who are witnessing it. So if kids watch a violent film, if kids watch um, a pro-social film, they may be more likely to act pro-socially. If kids watch, you know, whatever we see, we're more likely to learn how to do. Taking the concepts of these three theories, 
together kind of builds the basic foundation of behavior therapy. And then what we want to look at also is there's the acquisition of behavior. The acquisition is how the behavior is acquired, how I learn it. So the sort of picking up of the behavior. What therapists spend a lot of time doing sometimes is working on extinguishing behaviors. As I talked about with things like classically conditioned fear responses, many times we see clients where we're trying to uncondition people. That's the extinction of behavior. Two other concepts which are very big are internalization, and that's the sort of taking of what you've learned and making it a part of who you are. And generalization. Generalization is being able to take where you've learned the behavior and generalize it to the world at large. So if I've learned that in this laboratory setting, you know, if a bell rings, I get meat powder. So in this laboratory setting, I hear a bell and I start to salivate. If I'm out in the world, walking around the mall, and I happen to be in a shop that has bells, and my husband picks up a bell and rings it, do I suddenly start to salivate? If that doesn't happen, maybe I've not generalized. But generalization is something which we often want people to do. And what we're going to do with these sort of as our fundamental guiding principles is on the next tape, we're going to talk about how is behavior theory applied and what does it look like in practice.